NASA's Artemis III is no longer Elon Musk's one-man show. On his first day in the role, Jared Isaacman delivered an unusually direct message. First come, first served. It means NASA would pick whichever company finished its moon lander first, out of Musk's SpaceX or Bezos's Blue Origin. The statement is not a compliment. It is really a warning shot. For the first time, NASA is openly saying SpaceX could lose Artemis. That shift comes at a moment when SpaceX is drawing criticism for Starship schedule delays, while Blue Origin is presenting itself as a faster-moving alternative, arguing that it can compress timelines and capitalize on the opening. So what does first come, first served actually change? And based on the current check, which company is potentially ahead in the Artemis race? Since 2021, when NASA awarded SpaceX a $2.9 billion contract to develop Starship as the human landing system, the lunar program appeared to narrow into a single track. SpaceX moved ahead despite legal challenges from Blue Origin, and for a time, Artemis looked less like a competition and more like a schedule built around one company's execution. That balance began to shift as external pressure increased. China's clearly defined lunar ambitions introduced a geopolitical deadline that NASA could no longer treat as abstract. The priority moved from long-term program elegance to near-term national positioning. Speed, readiness, and optionality started to matter more than legacy procurement structure. Out of that environment came a noticeable policy adjustment. NASA began signaling flexibility less attachment to a single contractor, and more emphasis on demonstrated progress. The agency's language changed first, then its actions. Acting Administrator Sean Duffy reopened the landing discussion, citing delays and openly acknowledging that Artemis III would go to whichever system could meet the mission requirements first. That stance was later stated even more plainly under Jared Isaacman's leadership. I don't think it was lost on either vendor that whichever lander was available first to ensure that America achieves its strategic objectives on the moon is the one we were going to go with. The message was not about preference or punishment. It was about the outcome. This reframing puts SpaceX and Blue Origin under equal pressure. The prize is not just contractual. It carries symbolic weight. The distinction of returning humans to the moon for the first time in more than half a century. With that comes scrutiny, expectations, and very little tolerance for missed milestones. From a technical standpoint, SpaceX entered this phase with structural advantages. Starship HLS is not a clean sheet vehicle. It is derived from a system already designed for deep space cargo and crew transport. Engines, tanks, avionics, and manufacturing processes are shared. Reuse of core systems compresses development timelines in ways traditional programs struggle to match. That compression is reinforced by SpaceX's iteration-driven culture. Hardware is built quickly, tested aggressively, and replaced just as fast. Failures are treated as data points, not endpoints. Each version feeds directly into the next. The factory environment reflects that philosophy. It looks more like a mechanical workshop slash steel mill than a standard aerospace cleanroom. Yet even with those advantages, the hardest problem remains unsolved. Starship's lunar mission depends on large-scale ship-to-ship refueling in orbit, a process that has never been operationally demonstrated. Until that works reliably, schedule margins remain theoretical. Blue Origin comes from a different engineering tradition. The company has consistently favored a cautious, sequential development model, closer to classical waterfall design where systems are refined extensively on paper before they are exposed to flight conditions. The objective is to minimize surprises at first launch. That philosophy is reflected in its facilities, which are often described as very modern, clean, and having strict safety procedures. That approach has consequences for the timeline. New Glenn, Blue Origin's first orbital class rocket, took roughly 12 years to progress from early design work closely tied to the BE-4 engine program before 2013, to its first orbital flight on January 16, 2025. Over the same period, SpaceX conducted hundreds of Falcon 9 launches, accumulating operational experience in booster recovery, re-entry control, engine reuse, and launch cadence. 
those flights quietly built the technical foundation that now allows Starship to iterate at a much faster pace. During that gap, Blue Origin focused largely on New Shepard, a suborbital vehicle designed primarily for short-duration human flights. While technically successful, the program contributed little to orbital operations, deep space payload integration, or high-energy mission profiles. The company is not expected to begin flying NASA or commercial scientific payloads until the second New Glenn mission, currently projected for late 2025. That history has shaped skepticism about Blue Origin's readiness to compete at the scale required for sustained lunar operations. That perception has begun to shift. Over the past two years, Blue Origin has become more transparent about progress, publishing regular updates, and positioning its lunar program as a structured, test-driven campaign rather than a single leap. The company's approach to the moon is incremental. Fly uncrewed Mark I cargo landers first, then scale to the larger, crew-capable Mark II system later in the decade. The Mark I lander is designed as a self-funded robotic demonstrator, targeting a landing near Shackleton Crater as early as 2026. It means Blue Origin could go to the moon before SpaceX. This is thanks to Mark I, which does not rely on orbital refueling. It is intended to validate propulsion, avionics, and surface operations in lunar conditions. Data from Mark I feeds directly into the design of Mark II, which is planned to support crewed Artemis five missions around 2030, launched via New Glenn with an additional cryogenic upper stage. Recent signs suggest the program is moving from planning to integration. In mid-January, Blue Origin released imagery indicating that Blue Moon Mark I was undergoing final stacking in Florida. The company referenced upcoming acoustic testing, a milestone typically reserved for vehicles that are largely assembled and structurally complete. NASA Administrator Jared Isakman was shown observing the lander through a facility window a signal that the project has entered a more visible phase of oversight. A successful Mark I landing would be meaningful, but it would not settle the central challenge of human lunar transport. Carrying people to the moon requires sustained, large-scale in-orbit refueling. On that front, Blue Origin faces many of the same obstacles as SpaceX. Both systems depend on transferring supercold cryogenic propellants in space while managing boil-off, thermal gradients, automated docking, and precise fluid control in a vacuum. These operations must be repeatable, reliable, and safe at a multi-ton scale. The engineering demands are substantial, regardless of architecture. Blue Origin has indicated plans to demonstrate orbital refueling capabilities between 2026 and 2027 using New Glenn. SpaceX is targeting a similar window with its first large-scale Starship refueling tests expected around mid-2026. However, those challenges become more demanding for New Glenn. Its upper stage relies on BE-3U hydrogen engines, and liquid hydrogen introduces a different class of complexity than the methane-oxygen systems SpaceX uses. Hydrogen must be stored at roughly 20 Kelvin, making it both extremely cold and exceptionally light. To carry a meaningful amount of energy, tanks have to be larger, insulation more precise, and sealing far more exact. Hydrogen molecules are small enough to slip through microscopic gaps, increasing leak risk during storage and especially during tank-to-tank -tank transfers in orbit. Boil-off is also more aggressive, requiring near-perfect thermal control to keep losses within acceptable margins. On the ground, both companies report encouraging test results but neither has yet demonstrated large-scale cryogenic transfer in orbit, where vibration, thermal cycling, microgravity fluid behavior, and autonomous control all interact at once. This is where experience matters. SpaceX has accumulated years of flight time beyond Earth's atmosphere, while Blue Origin's limited orbital history remains its most visible constraint. That difference does not decide the outcome on its own, but it shapes the risk envelope. The question is no longer whether either system can work in theory, but which organization can turn theory into routine operation first, and do so with humans on board. Given these constraints, which approach do you think is more likely to deliver a crude lunar landing first? Let me know how you're weighing the evidence. 
If you found this breakdown valuable, you can support the channel by liking the video. Subscribe if you want more clear, technical coverage like this, and let me know your take in the comments. The contrast between the two companies is also visible in how they build their launch vehicles. SpaceX chose stainless steel as the primary structural material for Starship. It is inexpensive, forgiving to manufacture, easy to weld, and becomes stronger at cryogenic temperatures. Stainless steel also tolerates high re-entry heat, reducing dependence on fragile thermal protection systems and allowing design choices that favor speed of iteration over material optimization. New Glenn follows a more traditional aerospace path. Its structure relies on aluminum-lithium alloys produced through precision machining and friction stir welding paired with a carbon fiber composite fairing. This approach improves mass efficiency but increases production cost, manufacturing complexity, and sensitivity to cryogenic sealing issues, especially when hydrogen is involved. Propulsion choices reflect similar trade-offs. Starship clusters more than 30 Raptor engines on its booster, using a full-flow staged combustion cycle. Historically, this cycle was considered difficult to industrialize, but it delivers high efficiency and scales well in mass production. SpaceX's advantage lies less in any single engine than in its ability to manufacture and iterate them rapidly. New Glenn flies with seven BE-4 engines on its first stage, using an oxygen-rich staged combustion cycle. The design is simpler and more conservative, trading some efficiency for robustness. On the upper stage, BE-3U hydrogen engines deliver very high specific impulse, which matters for direct injection into high-energy orbits. Reuse philosophy diverges as well. Starship is designed for full and rapid reuse, including second-stage recovery, with the booster intended to be caught by a launch tower. The approach carries high technical risk, but promises minimal turnaround time if it succeeds. New Glenn opts for a more conventional barge landing for its booster, a lower risk method with higher operational overhead. The upper stage, for now, remains an open question. These choices place New Glenn closer to Falcon Heavy in mission class than to Starship. Its payload capacity is lower, but its Hydrolox upper stage excels at sending moderate masses directly into geostationary transfer orbit or lunar trajectories without refueling. That capability aligns well with Blue Origin's commercial launch ambitions. Starship, by contrast, is built around orbital refueling from the start. Its architecture assumes that propellant transfer becomes routine because its long-term objective lies beyond Earth orbit entirely. Mars drives the design, even when the near-term mission is the Moon.